Every year, hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions in the woods of North America. I'm talking about people who are right in front of someone and then in an instant, they're just gone. Or in other cases, they disappear and then are found again, but they're located in places that are impossible to get to. One former police detective named David Politis has investigated thousands of these strange disappearances and he documents what he finds in his incredible book series called Missing 411. Today, we're gonna look at three Missing 411 cases that even amongst strange disappearances, these rank as particularly bizarre. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please gift the like button a free stay at a Motel 6, but call ahead of time to ensure the staff does not leave the light on for them. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Seward, Alaska is a port city that's about 60 miles south of Anchorage, and it's home to one of the oldest foot races in America called the Mount Marathon Race. Now, this race is not actually a marathon because a marathon by definition is 26.2 miles long. The Mount Marathon Race is actually only three miles long, but it's considered one of the most challenging short races in the world because it's basically one and a half miles straight up a mountain and then one and a half miles straight back down again. Despite its grueling nature, there had never been a fatality or a disappearance during the running of this race, but that changed in 2012. 66-year-old Alaskan resident Paul LeMate was a career counselor on a military base in Anchorage. His job was to help outgoing military members adjust to civilian life, and his primary responsibility was helping them with their resume. Outside of work, Paul liked to keep himself in top physical shape, and one of his favorite activities was going for runs. And so in 2012, he finally committed to running the Mount Marathon race, something he had wanted to do for some time, but he kept putting it off. In the months leading up to the race, Paul trained hard to make sure he was ready. He wasn't trying to win the race or really even be competitive. He just wanted to finish the race in a respectable time. So at 3 p.m. on July 4th, 2012, Paul found himself at the start of the Mount Marathon race and his family was on the sidewalk cheering him on. The race director fired the starting gun and Paul, along with 500 other racers, took off. For reference, a man of Paul's age and physical fitness level should be able to complete this race in about two hours or less. But at 5 p.m., when virtually all the other runners had finished the race and Paul was nowhere to be found, his family members were concerned, but they knew he wasn't trying to win the race. They knew he was probably going to be on the slower end, but they were now starting to pay attention and were anxious for him to show up. 45 minutes later, a race timing crew up at the top of the mountain at the turnaround point began breaking down their setup. About 15 minutes later, when they were done, they started walking down the mountain right as Paul showed up at the top. And they said to him, you are the last racer on this course. Do you still want to continue? And he said, yes, I definitely still want to continue. And so the timing crew said, that's fine. Just take your time, be careful, and we'll see you at the bottom. And so the timing crew, they take off right in front of Paul going straight down this well-marked course and they would turn around and see Paul standing there, catching his breath, getting ready to make his own descent. And so the timing crew who was moving much faster than Paul very quickly got out of sight of him. And so before long, they were at the bottom, they turned around and there's no sign of Paul. So they went and found Paul's family and said, hey, we just spoke to him. He seems totally fine. But just so you know, if you don't see him in 90 minutes, I would contact the race officials and let them know because he should be down by then. And so Paul's family sat at the bottom of this race looking up expecting to see him any moment but 90 minutes came and went and he never showed up. They wound up waiting another 30 minutes just in case but again he didn't show up and so they informed race officials. The race officials immediately contacted the Alaskan state troopers and a search was launched for him because now fog's rolling in this is a dangerous course and it's starting to get pretty late. All night, hundreds of expert Alaskan searchers combed this mountain, both on the course, outside the course. They even went on the backside of Mount Marathon, where it would have been extremely difficult for Paul to have gotten there. He would have had to climb up and over the mountain, which is just extremely unlikely, but they figured we can't leave any stone unturned. And so all night they're looking, they got dogs out, and there's no sign of him. The next morning, when the fog cleared up, they brought in helicopters with thermal cameras, and they continued to search the mountain. But after four more days, they never found Paul or any of his belongings and so they called off the search. It was like Paul had just vanished. Now it's easy to jump to the conclusion that Paul must have just gotten disoriented
disoriented and lost the course track and then maybe he fell or he was attacked by an animal like a bear because this is Alaska. But there's a couple problems with that. The first one is the course itself is extremely well marked. This race is one of the oldest in America. They've been doing this for over a hundred years and they've never had a missing person or a fatality. So they know how to keep people safely inside of the course bounds. The other issue is the timing crew saw Paul at the top, at the turnaround, and he was physically okay. He was talking to them, he was not distressed, and he would have very clearly seen where to go next because he would have seen the timing crew leaving ahead of him going down the trail that he would have to follow. Clearly, something unusual happened to Paul either at the summit after the timing crew left or on the way down because rational explanations cannot account for how Paul could vanish so completely in such a controlled environment with so many expert searchers looking for him. But to this day, no one has ever found Paul or even the slightest trace that he was ever on that mountain. In late August of 2004, Kevin Bardsley and his 12-year-old son Garrett went on a father-son Boy Scout camping trip in the Uinta Mountains in northern Utah. Their campsite was situated next to Lake Cuberant inside of the Wasatch National Forest. The lake was actually pretty remote and difficult to access because it was almost completely surrounded by huge mountains. The only side you could get to the lake on was its western side, but the western trail leading to it was very cumbersome because you had to bypass seven different lakes. And so by the time Kevin, Garrett, and the rest of the Boy Scouts and their fathers were at the lake, they were at least an hour's hike away from the nearest civilization. Early in the morning on August 20th, Kevin and Garrett woke up, they hopped out of their tents, none of the other campers had woken up yet, and so they decided they would head down to the lake to get some early fishing in. And so they got their gear and they began walking down the very well-defined 150 meter long trail down to the lake. As they get there, the sun's coming up over the mountains and they're really excited about their day of fishing. And so as Kevin is preparing a fishing rod for Garrett, Garrett was jumping around on different stones that were poking out of the water. And at some point he tripped and he fell into the water, soaking his shoes in his pants. And so he hopped out of the water and he's kind of laughing at himself and he told his dad that he didn't care. He'd fish with wet feet and wet pants and he would change them later. And so Kevin laughed and handed his son his fishing rod and then the two of them began to fish. After a while when they hadn't caught anything, Garrett said to his dad that, you know what dad, this is actually pretty uncomfortable. I'm gonna go change my pants and my socks. And so Kevin said, no problem. I'll be here with our gear. I'll see you when you get back. And so Garrett stands up and he starts walking back up the well-defined 150 meter trail back up towards the campsite. And Kevin actually turned around and watched his son disappear into the trees, but he heard the sound of other campers at the campsite and so knew his son wouldn't be alone. For the next couple of minutes, Kevin kept fishing, but periodically would look over his shoulder, expecting to see Garrett come out of the woods again, but he didn't. And after about 20 minutes, Kevin was a little bit concerned, so he picked up his fishing gear and began walking back up the trail towards the camp. When he got there, he saw other Boy Scouts and their fathers just getting up and having a bite to eat, and he's scanning around the campsite and he doesn't see Garrett. And so he goes over to Garrett's tent and he opens it up and Garrett's not in there and there's no sign that he's removed any of his wet clothing in there. And so Kevin turns around and he asks one of the fathers, hey, have you seen Garrett? He was supposed to be up here a minute ago. And the father said, no, I haven't seen him. And so Kevin's starting to panic and he yells out to the group, hey, has anyone seen my son? Do you guys know where Garrett went? He was supposed to be up here. And no one knew where he was. They said, no, we haven't seen him. And so horrified, Kevin drops all of his gear and starts running back towards the lake, screaming for his son. And the other campers instinctively know what's going on. And so they chase after him, yelling for Garrett. Almost immediately, the sheriff's department was notified and they launched this huge search that included the FBI. And so hundreds of people have descended into the area around the lake and they're looking for Garrett. They can't find him. But later that afternoon, searchers were about a half mile away from where Garrett was last seen. And they found a single Nike sock that appeared to have been removed from a wet foot wedged into one of the boulders in this huge boulder field. Garrett's mother would confirm that was Garrett's sock. And so the search effort was shifted to this big boulder field. And for days, they looked all over the place for him, but there was no sign of Garrett anywhere. And so eventually the search was terminated. The authorities determined this was an accident that Garrett's father and the other campers had nothing to do with Garrett's disappearance. What their theory was is Garrett must have gotten lost on the walk back to the camp and then ultimately died of exposure. But the idea that a boy of Garrett's age would get lost along a well-defined 150 meter long trail that he was familiar with, that he had been on that day, 
that seems a little far-fetched. Also, as Garrett was walking down that trail, he would have heard the sounds of the other campers in the campsite. So that would have helped him figure out exactly where he needed to go. He's on a well-marked trail, he's walking towards the sound of the voices. But he never made it to the campsite because no one at the camp saw him and there was no sign that he had put his wet clothes in his tent. So something happened to Garrett almost immediately when he left his father that caused him to wind up a half mile away in a boulder field with one sock missing. It screams abduction case. But remember, this campsite was over an hour's hike away from the nearest civilization, and they know this group of Boy Scouts and their fathers were the only ones in the area that day. It is possible that an animal could have taken Garrett like a mountain lion, but there would have been signs of a struggle and they didn't find any on the trail or anywhere nearby. And you would figure if he was getting dragged off by a big predator, he would have yelled out for help, but he didn't. He just left his dad, it was total silence, and then he vanished. And all we have is his one sock. In 1950, when Rosemary was 21 years old, she married the love of her life, Charles Bud Kunst, and they moved into a house together in San Anselmo, California. Together, they had six children and 11 grandchildren. They were known as a very active couple that when they were not with their family and their grandkids, they were out on a hiking trail somewhere enjoying the outdoors. In 1998, Rosemary's life was derailed when she and her husband were in a horrific car accident. When she came to in the hospital, she was very badly injured, and she was told that her husband of nearly 50 years had not survived. Rosemary was devastated. She was lost without Bud. But for the next several months, she poured her energy into her rehab, which took up a lot of her time, and it kept her mind off of this terrible loss. But when she got back to strength and returned home, a wave of grief washed over her, and she began to desperately miss Bud. In 2000, when Rose turned 70, she heard about a backpacking trip that was being led by a group called the Earth Circle Organization, and it sounded like the perfect way for Rose to attempt to reconnect with her late husband. The group was led by an elder and chief of the Carrick tribe. His name was Charlie Red Hawk Tom, and every year he would bring this group out to Spirit Lake, which is inside of a wilderness area near Mount Shasta in California, and there they would go to the altar that Red Hawk had built right on the edge of this lake, and they would perform spirit dances and attempt to communicate with their dead loved ones. Rose wasn't going into this thinking she was literally going to be speaking to Bud. She wanted to just find a way to connect with him spiritually, so she was very excited about this trip. The lake itself sits at the base of a heavily forested bowl with high steep walls all around it. In fact, some people say it reminds them of being inside of a mini volcano. And because of those high steep walls, there's actually only one way in or out to the lake, and that's on the north side. The only other semi-feasible way to get in or out of the lake would be on the south side where a river flows down into the lake. And where that river flows, the embankment is less steep, although it's still a 70 degree angle and would require climbing gear. And the terrain would be completely slick from the water running over it. So you could do it, but realistically, nobody does that. So on August 17th, Rosemary, along with Red Hawk, Red Hawk's 12 year old son, a cook and 11 other people set out for Spirit Lake. After a rigorous 12 mile horseback ride, they they finally arrived at Spirit Lake and they established their camp right on the trail that leads in and out. That night, all the participants had dinner together and then they made their way over to the altar right next to the lake where Red Hawk was and he performed a spirit dance and then afterwards, as a group, they attempted to call out to their dead loved ones. The following morning at 9 a.m., once everyone was up, Red Hawk informed the group that they were going to take a day trip to another lake and they'd be back that evening. Rose told Red Hawk that she'd actually prefer to just stay at their campsite and enjoy the beauty of the lake, and Red Hawk told her that was just fine. So Red Hawk and the main group left, leaving behind Rosemary, as well as Red Hawk's 12-year-old son named Chalet and the cook. A little while later at 1 p.m., Rose decided she wanted to take a little hike around the side of the lake, and so she asked Chalet if he wanted to join her. He said, thank you for the offer, but I'm gonna stay here with the cook. And so Rosemary said, that's totally fine. I don't mind going by myself. And so she asked the cook for some food. He handed her a bag lunch. She took it, said thank you, and then set off by herself heading south. Four hours later at 5 p.m. when Red Hawk and the rest of the group got back to the camp, Chalet and the cook informed him that Rosemary had not come back yet. A group was immediately sent out to look for her, but there was no sign of her. And so Red Hawk turned to his son and to the cook and said, explain to me again what happened. And they said she was totally normal. She just wanted to go for a hike and she took some food and we watched her disappear into the trees. They also told Red Hawk that they had been sitting in the trail that leads in and out of the lake the entire time Rosemary was gone and they never saw her. So she didn't leave the lake, she's somewhere out there. Confused and very concerned, Red Hawk had one of the other participants leave the lake and go contact authorities. And within 24 hours, there were 50 searchers combing 
doing the leg for Rosemary. The head of the search and rescue team was a guy named Grizz Adams, who had led many other search and rescue efforts. After studying the area and talking to Chalet and the cook and the others who were there, he just could not understand how a 70 year old woman had managed to vanish so quickly and completely because there's no way she climbed out the south exit because she didn't have climbing gear and physically she probably wasn't capable of that even with the right gear. And she didn't leave through the north exit, the main trail, because Chalet and the cook were there the entire time and they never saw saw her. So where was she? As the search continued to find nothing, Grizz called in more searchers on horseback, helicopters, and dog teams. But the dog teams immediately proved to be useless because they were unable to pick up her scent, despite the fact they knew exactly where she started and where she was going. Grizz said that was highly unusual. For the next several days, searchers looked in and around the lake and up onto the mountainsides, and all they could ever find was a small tuft of Rosemary's hair about a half mile away from where she was last seen. But this hair did not help investigators come up with a theory as to what happened. Ultimately, after almost a week of searching and not finding their mother, Rosemary's children elected to terminate the search. Grizz Adams, the head of the search effort, said the only time he's ever seen something like this is when someone was trying to disappear. They were trying to end their life. But Rosemary, before she went on this hike, she asked Chalet to come with her. She wanted company. That's not indicative of someone that's trying to hurt themselves. But regardless of the reason, to this day, Rosemary has never been found. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please gift the like button a free stay at a Motel 6, but ensure you call ahead of time and tell the staff not to leave the light on. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post short videos. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination. Just know that I really appreciate your support, and until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.